A couple of years ago, I flew home to visit family. I would be there for about a week and then we would head to the coast for a week and then back home for another week. I totally needed this break. I had just ended an on again off again relationship, like seriously one day on and the next off. It took seven months of putting up with it because you're supposed to fight for what is important to you, right? Anyhow, I finally just said that it was done. No more chances, no trying to work it out, just done. So with that chapter of my life being over, I was more than happy to be somewhere else, surrounded by family, and begin putting myself back together. Got there, spent a couple of days sleeping a lot. My mother's a nurse and she was becoming concerned that there was something physically wrong with me. I just needed a couple days in a safe place, where I could let my brain work on digesting the new life I would have when I got back home. So, before we left for the coast, I met up with a friend from grade school that I had kept in contact with over the years. I thought it would just be he and I, but it didn't really faze me that another person was there. We hung out for a while and then I needed to head home because I had to take a backwoods route to get home, or take a different route that would add another 20 miles onto my track. Being backwoods, I needed to be able to keep an eye out for deer. So I said goodbye and told my friend's friend that if he was ever in my neck of the woods, look me up and we would grab a drink and hang out. I told him to grab my number from my friend and out the door that I went. About halfway home, I got this weird, queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. So I slowed way down and sure enough, there is a deer in the middle of the road. Because I had slowed down, I could see another car out on the road. I couldn't shake the queasy feeling, so I figured it would be better to cut off and go down the main road because there were more places to stop. I seriously didn't want to stop in some rural farmer's driveway. I've watched too many movies to make that mistake. So I get over to the main road and pull into a gas station and I sit there for a couple of minutes trying not to get sick to my stomach. I ran into the store, grabbed some water and ginger ale, and came back out to my vehicle, still unable to shake that queasy feeling. So I started to head home from the gas station and knew I didn't want to go straight home. So I drove around, taking this road or that road, until that weird feeling started to go away. And then I went home, read for a bit, and then went to sleep. Next day, everything was fine and we headed off to the coast. Fast forward two weeks. The trip is over and I'm still feeling a little bit fragile over the breakup, but that's all. I figured I would begin the process of cleansing the environment of negative energies and then work through the baggage that came from the breakup. I knew there was a lot and that it would take time. So the next day, I'm going about my business and everything as cool as can be when picking through the junk left behind after a breakup. I'm really just doing mindless things to zone out and not to have to think too much on the activity, since my brain was working full time already. A little bit later in the day, my phone rings. I don't get a lot of calls so I assumed that there might be a family emergency and that I needed to answer it ASAP. The area code of the caller, who is not in my contacts, is the same as my cousin, so I answered without a second thought. On the other end was my friend's friend, S.A., the acquaintance that I met at my friend's house. It's a little weird to have him be calling me, but I'm not thinking that anything is terribly out of the ordinary. I asked him what was up and he said that he was at the airport. I still find it a little odd but say, oh, that's cool, where are you going? He said that he had already landed. Again, I'm distracted and really just want to get him off the phone so I could go back to my mental sidestep and zone out while my brain chugged away. So I said that I hoped that he had a good time wherever he was. He said that he needed me to pick him up. What? Did you say you needed me to pick you up? Yeah, he replied. I came to visit you. I paused there for a second. 
I know for a fact that I didn't show any more interest in him than general courtesy. Even the tossed over the shoulder look me up comment was one of those polite things to say because you never actually plan on seeing them again. Why did you come to visit me? I asked. He said that he felt a deep connection and wanted to be with me. I'm starting to get angry as well as freaked out at this stage. I told him that I didn't feel the connection at all. I couldn't believe that he would fly across country to see someone that he had spent maybe two hours with. He said that I had invited him when I said to look him up. I said no, I don't think so. That's just a polite thing to say to some random person that has made a very small impression on me. He said that he needed to find a way back home then since I had misled him. Misled him? What the heck? Look me up if you're ever in my neck of the woods I had led him to think that was the basis for any sort of encounter that was meaningful. He said that he needed a place to stay until he could get the money for a plane ticket back. I said that there were more than enough hotels that he could stay at while he got himself sorted out. He said that he didn't have any money after buying the random, one-way plane ticket. So at this stage, I'm flabbergasted angry and freaked out that someone would do that on a one-way ticket. I finally caved and said that he could stay the night while he sorted everything out. But I expected him to be gone no later than the morning of the day after tomorrow. So I bring him to my place, throw pillows and a blanket on the couch and turn to head to my bedroom. And he asks if he can sleep with me. I'm like, uh, no. No way that's going to happen. So I point out that I have firearms and do not attempt to come in. The next day, I have to work, so I woke him up and told him to get up and find a way home immediately. I also told him that I had to work, but I would check in on his progress because the next morning, I was dropping him off at the airport regardless of whether or not he had to wait back. I went to work and he blew up my phone all day, wanted me to come back to my place for lunch, told him that I couldn't and that I was way too busy. I finally got home from work and I'm chuckling at a text that I got about my dog. And that's when I noticed that he had rearranged everything. And by everything, I mean every room of the house had been rearranged. I flipped my lid. I asked him why he thought it was normal to do anything that he did. Instead of answering, he asked me who I had been talking to. I said that it really wasn't any of his business but I had received a text from the guy watching my dog while I was on vacation. Color me shot when he says that he doesn't want me to talk to that guy. I'm no longer freaked, but full force apocalyptic disaster is about to be unleashed and leave nothing but a smoking crater. The temperature drops about 10 degrees and I very calmly said to get his stuff and I was calling a cab to take him to the airport because he's a complete psycho. Side note, Full rage had been achieved when it feels like the temperature drops and I speak very calmly. If I'm complaining about something, it's a quick burn. If I go monotone calm and tilt my head to one side slightly, that's where I hit arctic level anger. So, he unaware of the environmental change that has occurred, and that the chances of survival are dropping by the second, decides to tell me that he used my computer and got my ex's phone number and they both agree that I was just heartless. We're fast approaching the epic scale disaster and he finally seems to notice how deep into rage I had sunk. I told him it was unlikely that he had gotten into my computer because it's a full quote of a part of The Art of War by Sun Tzu and that he would have had to have been the processing power of the Hadron Collider computers and it was obvious that that was not the case. I told him that he had three minutes to get his stuff and get out or I wouldn't be responsible for what would occur. So, still yelling insults at me, he gathered his stuff up and he left. I used to get calls and texts from him. I would block one and six more would pop up, but it eventually stopped. To this day, I have no idea, nor interest in knowing where he's at or if he made it back. This happened to me when I was about 14. I was best friends with this girl Robin. 
We've long since parted ways, but I used to stay over at hers all the time. Robin was an only child to an older couple, both roughly about 60. Her house was old and the bedrooms were quite small. She had a thing for decorating her room and spooky things. It was overcrowded with trinkets and clothes, which looked really cool but it meant that after we were finished watching Trashies and 90s anime, you know the good stuff. At 4 o'clock in the morning, I would go to sleep in the spare bedroom, or I would risk suffocating under a pile of gothic teddy bears and Pokemon on her floor. One evening, her parents went to the local pub just down the street with some old friends, so I stayed over. It was great. A free house for just the two of us, and they made sure that we had all the junk food that we could want. They were really sweet and always made sure that we felt safe before leaving. I should also mention that they never brought guests home, especially when their daughter had a friend over here. For the most part, I had a great night. When it was time to eventually go to sleep, I went into what I called my room because I was there so often. It was small than just to fit a wardrobe, a dresser, and a double bed, which considering I had a single bed and shared a room with my sister, it was luxury. We would usually spend another hour sending each other DS picto chat messages until one of us fell asleep. I curled up into bed and passed out pretty quick. Sometime around 4am I think, I awoke to someone fidgeting at the door handle. At first, I was a bit confused as Robin would always almost message me through picto chat if she was going to come into my room. The door was rattling at this stage and I was a bit freaked. It lasted a couple of minutes, but then the rattling subsided. I rolled over and tried to calm myself down thinking that it might have been her dad or mom making sure the door was closed. I don't know, I was confused. I'm not sure at this point if I fell asleep or what, but I didn't hear anyone entering the room. And then I hear this splashing sound. I remember thinking it was really loud and clear, and as these seconds went by... I realized this wasn't a part of a dream. This was something I was actually hearing. So, as I was facing the wall, I rolled my head around as silently as I could, and I could see this very tall man next to my bed, facing the corner. He was so close to me. He was tall, at least 6'3", and he had a thick black short haircut, and he was incredibly pale and toned. He looked to be in his early 30s or something, and he was wearing nothing but a pair of black boxers. What in the world? There was no way this could be her dad while he was almost as tall as this guy. Her dad was visibly older, had silver hair and the top of his head was bald. There was no way anyone could confuse him with this guy. I was in shock. I had no idea what was happening and I remember feeling my heart in my mouth. I didn't know what to do. I just stared in shock for a couple of seconds and then, as quiet as I could, turned back around and just pretended to be asleep. I remember trying to control my breathing so he wouldn't notice me. Eventually he left and I was awake for what felt like an hour too afraid to move. I didn't know who this guy was and if he was still outside my door. Did he see me? If he saw me, what would he do? I didn't hear anyone else in the house. There was no talking and the walls in this house were paper thin. When I eventually worked up the nerve, I darted into Robin's room and broke down. I was panicking and she just kept laughing at me, saying I was being ridiculous. I was lying. I was just having a nightmare. She told me to go back to bed and I refused to go into the room. I didn't feel safe. She rolled her eyes and we both went into the room. She looked around and suddenly started shrieking. She had just stepped into a puddle of pee. I told you. It was everywhere. It was on the wardrobe, on the dresser, and soaked into the carpet. At that point, she was just as confused as I was. Even so, it was 5am. So she grabbed my pillow and blanket from the room. And I gladly took my chance with the teddy avalanche and slept on her floor. The next morning, I remember being incredibly wary of her dad. 
There was no other male figure around, and they weren't the kind of people to have people over, especially when their daughter had guests over. So I directed my fear and confusion at him. I knew it wasn't him, though, but at that point, I was just so anxious around any kind of male figure. I remember sitting around the breakfast table and Robin still wasn't sure what to make of it. Somehow part of her didn't want to believe me, even when she saw the evidence for herself. I didn't say anything to her parents, and neither did she. I went home scared, confused, and out of my friends and family, no one seemed to believe me. It wasn't until recently that I retold the story to a group of friends and my best friend who I was friends with at the time, and they reacted with, Wait, that was real? We all thought you were just making it up. Later on, my sister told me that the houses in the area are connected through the attics, and that you can get from one house to another. Maybe somebody crawled through there and gotten in. But why were they almost naked? And did they know that I was there? I never really understood what happened. Needless to say... I never slept in that room and never slept alone in that house ever again. So yeah, person who broke into my room and peed all over the place. I hope I don't see you again. I was just recently reminded of this story by another hitchhiking story on here. My dad used to tell me and my brother all sorts of stories from his youth hitchhiking down the east coast. There are two that have always really stuck with me and I figured if you guys like this one, I'll talk about the other one too. When my dad was 15, he left home in Massachusetts and hitchhiked down to Florida, where his older sister was living in Daytona. This event apparently happened on his trip somewhere in Virginia. He had been trying to hitch a ride outside of some city, though he could never remember which one. This happened in 76 and there were a lot of drugs done between then and now. And this really nice car stopped and picked him up. He and the driver get to talking and the guy tells my dad that he's a surgeon at one of the local hospitals. He gives him a business card and tells him if he ever needs anything at that hospital to give them his name. All seems to be going well, and he is apparently heading pretty far south for some family function, so it's a long way that my dad doesn't have to walk. He seems like a nice, professional guy, clean-cut and well-spoken. But then stuff starts to get weird. My dad's exact wording at this part of the story every time that he tells it. And the doctor starts giving my dad the side-eye, and seems like he wants to say something but can't quite figure out how to say it. Of course, my dad is just sort of ignoring him because, as he says, I had been on the road for a while and hadn't had a shower or a change in clothes in weeks. Then the guy finally comes out and says it. Can I suck? My dad was obviously taken aback by this and he tells him no. Please, just a little. No. I'll give you 50 bucks if you let me do it. No. How about you let me see it then? Can I see it? No. I think you better let me off here. And surprisingly, without any resistance, the guy does. He pulls off at a rest stop and he lets my dad out. Before he pulls away... He hands my dad that 50 bucks and he tells him, Sorry about that, man. I hope I didn't blow your mind or anything. This isn't super creepy, but I thought you guys might like it. My dad always says that the guy didn't seem like a bad guy. Just really messed up. And honestly sorry to have freaked him out so bad. I have no way of knowing if it is totally true. Except that my aunt says my dad told her the same story when he got to Florida just a few weeks later. Now 
This past New Year's was mine and my boyfriend's four year anniversary. We typically don't do much so, this year we decided to make it special by planning a romantic getaway. At the time, the two of us were living in Seattle and wanted to rent a cabin in a snowy small town for the weekend. We found a cabin on Airbnb with a hot tub and we were sold. The cabin was, of course, the last house on the road. To get to it, you had to drive down a small removed private road that ended in a roundabout. Off the roundabout was a long uphill driveway leading up to the cabin. We got to the cabin and it was snowy and beautiful. The cabin itself sat on top of a garage and you needed to take stairs on the back side of the property to get to the front door. When we got inside, there was a booklet with all the cabin's info outlined. The book said that during the snowy season, don't be surprised if their contracted snowplowers showed up to clear off the driveway. Okay, sounds good. We unpacked and realized that there was no service on either of our phones, but the booklet told us that there was a landline in the cabin if we needed anything. We spent the first night by the fire playing board games and drinking wine. The weekend was exactly what we needed. We planned to spend the next day in town and that night. I had booked us a reservation for a nice dinner. We were gone almost all day, only returning briefly to get dressed up to enjoy some good food. Dinner was great and we were excited to head back to the cabin for some champagne hot tubbing. While at dinner, the temperature had dropped and it snowed for the first time that day, coating everything in a fresh layer of powder. We drove down the private road and got to the driveway. At that point, my boyfriend stopped the car, headlights shining in front, and asked if I noticed the new tire tracks. I looked at the driveway, hoping to quickly disregard the new tire tracks, but they were there. Immediately, we remembered that these snowplowers could have stopped by. But the issue was that we saw the tire tracks because of the snow and who plows in the dark. We also knew that once we were at the cabin, that we had no service on our cell phones. So we figured that we would head back into town and message our Airbnb host and ask them if one of their friends had stopped by the apartments. We waited for a while in town for a reply from our host but didn't hear back. We could have called but at that point it was past 10 and we didn't want to be bad guys. We figured that we blew the whole thing out of proportion and that we might as well head back to the cabin. After all, I am a big true crime fan, and I like spooky subreddits and horror movies, so I was probably just psyching myself out. My boyfriend drove us back, and this time, we actually drove up the driveway. Towards the top of the hill, the part of the driveway, I noticed something. My stomach dropped as I noticed footprints on the property. We backed on the driveway and took a closer look to see if there were more footprints. From what it looked like, someone had driven up the driveway, reversed down, part, and then got out of the car and walked onto the property. Since we had now also driven on the tracks that we couldn't find where the footprints ended, the property was quite large with tons of trees and brush, and we knew that these footprints could go anywhere. The moment that we saw footprints, we decided to call the police. We figured that it was better safe than sorry. We would just have the officer go onto the property with us to check everything out. We drove back down the road until we were able to get service, called the police and waited for their arrival. A policeman showed up and we followed him onto the property. The officer scanned the property and determined that no one was out there. Obviously, we're a little shaken up and a lot embarrassed and we thanked the officer as he laughed. Needless to say, neither of us wanted to sit in the hot tub in the dark woods after what had happened. Instead, we locked the doors up and watched a movie, Champagne Less. We were both tired from the day and we passed out pretty quickly. At 3 a.m., we both woke up on the couch with the TV on and all the lights, laughing about how the night didn't turn out as planned. As my boyfriend went to brush his teeth, 
we heard a noise. It sounded mechanical and it only lasted a few seconds. We looked at each other and froze. The garage door. There are very few reasons that someone would need to open the garage door of a guest occupied Airbnb at 3 in the morning. Like I said, we woke up to all the lights on and the cabin had lots of windows. We knew that if someone was outside, they knew we were here and they could see us. I immediately grabbed the landline and I dialed 911. We sat crouched in the Airbnb, praying for the police to arrive. We knew that whoever had made those tracks were still on the property, and this time they were making noise. As I sat talking to the operator, we heard a bang in our balcony as if someone threw something up onto it. I was losing my mind when the operator told me that the police were nearby. All of a sudden, they were there. We saw the police lights and watched them search the property. Soon, we heard a banging on the door and it was the police and we were okay. At the door were two policemen, one in front of us and one a little behind, kind of kicking around snow and looking at the ground. I immediately noticed that the police officer in the back as the officer that did the initial check on the property. The police officer told us that not only was the garage door shut, but it was locked. And again... There were no signs of anyone on the property. When we discussed leaving, but the police officer said the road conditions were too dangerous that time of night. I looked at the police officer who had come out to the property twice, and I felt that I had deeply disappointed him. My boyfriend and I went back inside, again locking all the doors and trying to fall asleep. The next day we were leaving, and while we survived the night... I didn't feel right in the cabin anymore. It was forever the spooky cabin in my head, and I wanted to leave. As we packed up, we heard the same noise that we had heard at 3am. Oh, it was the heater. A heater that sounds just like a garage that sounds last the same duration. My boyfriend looked at me and immediately said, You need to give up your murder shows, and walked away. As if. As for the banging on the balcony, it was just the perfectly timed to fall of a pine cone. I promise I'm not paranoid. I think back on this story a lot and I'm embarrassed about how little came of it, but I'm also incredibly grateful for the same reason. But whoever drove onto the property and walked around, thank you for triggering all of my nightmares. About a year ago, I spent a decent amount of time working in a different city than I currently live in. One day was very cold and the Airbnb that I had booked was pretty far away. I didn't have a car and had failed to pack a warm coat. I ducked into the Kmart nearby to buy something that I could wear on my walk, with the intention of returning it the following morning. My best option was this enormous XXL fuzzy bathrobe. My walk home led me through this beautiful botanic garden along a waterway. It was nearing midnight and I was halfway through my journey. I'm usually quite aware when I'm out, especially at night, but I had let my guard down a bit, due in part to the enormous bathrobe that I had wrapped around me. It was like wearing a fuzzy suit of armor. Suddenly, I felt intensely uncomfortable. I couldn't quite put my finger on what I had heard but my immediate thought was a couple of males holding a whispered conversation. Then I rounded a corner and ducked into some trees, sucking my breath in and straining to understand what I was hearing. Light footsteps. Voices. Two men neared my hiding spot on the path, and I internally berated myself for not being more careful. Nobody was out, so screaming would do nothing. I'm a very small female, so this situation was one of my worst nightmares. As they passed, I heard, She's around here somewhere. I felt physically sick, until one of the guys let out a low whistle, and I heard the jingle of a collar, a dog scurrying past my spot, and a good girl followed by smoochy noises. 
An intense sense of relief followed. They were talking about their beloved dog, not hunting me. They seemed harmless, endearing even. I readjusted my bathrobe to cover my head. It was that cold out, and I popped out from the trees. I didn't realize until later that I looked at myself in the mirror that the bathrobe arms were now on top of my head, sticking out like some grotesque, bulbous, monster appendages. I also didn't realize that the men had stopped, or were walking very slowly, only a few meters ahead on the path. One of the men screamed in terror when they saw my emergence from the trees. The other swore loudly, and they both took off running across the bridge over the waterway, followed closely by their dog who was now barking frantically. I still have the picture that I took of myself in the mirror after the incident, and I get the giggles every time I see it. I must admit, it was a rush to finally be on the other end of a situation like this. Okay, so back when I was in the military, I was based out in California. This was pretty much right at the start of the housing bust and I found myself newly divorced following a deployment. As such, I could no longer live on base and die to move. I quickly discovered that it was now the same price or cheaper to rent a house instead of an apartment off base so I got in touch with a realtor who worked with residents of a local gated community. As a newly single female with zero family in the area, I thought extra security could be a good thing. I soon found the perfect house. It was amazing. Had a wraparound porch with a view of the lake and the center of the community. Had trees blocking my views of my neighbors. And an awesome kitchen. I love cooking. And tons of local wildlife. I could easily see myself recovering from what had been an ungodly rough year. The owner mostly lived overseas though, I never really dealt with him except when I moved but he seemed really nice, if a bit particular. He obviously loved the house so I didn't think much of that. The two times that I needed something, I looked after his brother and he came to deal with them as he was a handyman of sorts. I always found it a bit weird that him and his brother looked like they could have been twins, to the point where I thought his brother was him when he came to pick up the dryer when it needed fixing. Literally, he picked it up and carried it out in his arms. The funny thing about PTSD brain, though, is that lots of normal things seem weird, while strange things seem normal. So I never really thought of the landlord brother situation as odd until after that. Maybe it was normal and the whole oddness of what happened is setting off my paranoia, I don't really know. But yeah, landlord odd. Brother was apparently the hog. Both spoke to me like I was their kid who needed very strict instructions. Anyway, I enjoyed my time in the house. My ace pup loved it too because the next door neighbors had dogs for her to play with. But my PTSD and other mental health issues had me on a path headed straight for a medical separation. But then the president issued a series of rollback programs, a chance for military members to separate ahead of contract in anticipation for the Middle Eastern conflicts to be abandoned. And my commander, Hadi suggested, if you're military, you know this basically means do this or else, for me to take the early separation. There were a few reasons surrounding this, but the main was that the squadron knew they were the reason I was mentally fracked up. And there were more than a few of the people who had it in for me still at the clinic that I was assigned to. Those people kept writing me up for things that no one else got written up for. May examples of this. Accidentally jamming the shredder that jammed at least once a week. Leaving the front desk unattended while I was having an anaphylactic attack. Having a panic attack which left work unattended because I was literally curled up into a ball in the corner. You get the picture. Of course, my brain took most of this stuff at face value and figured it was okay and that I deserved it. But my commander was trying to protect me as best as she could, and get me out of a clearly hostile work environment ASAP. So I applied and I was approved for separation. Now, this meant I was leaving my lease before the year was out. 
I forgot if my landlord just decided to be nice or if I had to pull out a law about military members being entitled to early release from at least when their duty assignments changed. Probably the second one because he wasn't happy. I didn't really have the mental capacity to care too much about putting him out though because my scrambled brains all of a sudden had a lot of military paperwork and processing to deal with. Not to mention the fact that the whole idea that I was separating felt very surreal in the first place. I had always thought I would be a lifer. I didn't tell any of my neighbors that I was moving. Only one of my friends knew when exactly I was moving out. And even my movers didn't know exactly when because I stayed there on an air mattress for about a week after they had picked up my things. I was camping my way across the country on my way home. So I had a lot of stuff to move in my car too. To the best of my knowledge, no one on the base knew exactly when my house would be vacant either because I actually stayed in a motel off base for a few days after I had moved out, just to make the final days of last minute paperwork easier. The house was about 40 minutes from my base while the motel was only 10. They knew what my travel plans, I was on separation leave for that time, which meant I was technically still in the military and they needed to know exactly where I was. But I had marked my starting location for the trip as my base and not the house. What you should be getting out of this is that only two people for sure knew the exact date that I was leaving the house. My friend and my landlord. He would likely told his brother and his realtor as well but I'm not sure. That said, even my landlord didn't know the exact date that I would be leaving the area. Just when I would vacate the premises. My landlord had told me to drop my house keys in the realtor's mailbox so that's what I did. And a few days later, I left on my road trip home. Now about a day later, I got a phone call from my landlord. I'm on the road with my pup when I answer. The conversation follows. Hey, um, you left your camera here. Are you sure? Yeah, it's a Nikon with a nice set of lenses and a camera bag. Oh, I don't have one of those. Really? My brother said you did. I try to think back and remember his brother coming over to drop off the dryer while my sister and nephew were in town. She's an avid photographer and I figured she must have had the camera bag out in preparation for our day trip to San Francisco. No, I only use one of those cannons that can fit in your pocket. He must be thinking of my sister's but she for sure brought that home with her months ago. The landlord is silent for a while before her. Well, what about this sleeping bag that's here? No, I definitely have my sleeping bag. Again, the landlord described my sleeping bag. No, I have mine. I slept in it last night. Well, there's a backpack too with a few random items. His tone then changed to accusatory. Did you tell one of your friends you could stay here for the rest of your lease? No. Only one of my friends even knows exactly when I moved out, and he's visiting his wife who is deployed in Korea right now. Well, someone's been living here. At this point, it should have occurred to me how weird it was that he'd gone from friendly, hey you forgot this, to angry, you let someone squat here so quickly. But it was only just getting through my head that someone had clearly moved in the moment that I moved out. This house didn't have an attic so this couldn't have been one of those. Someone was living in the attic while I was living there and moved down into the house after I left. There wasn't a sealed off part of the house where this could be done and I even went into the basement on a regular basis. It's possible that someone was living in the woods behind the house but I have no idea. Anyway, my landlord wanted me to come over and check this stuff to make sure that it wasn't mine. I told him that I'd finished up my paperwork so I was on the road and already in Oregon. He clearly hadn't expected me to already have left the area since I still had a few days on my lease. Yeah, looking back it should have struck me as weird that he was already in the house but I figured he had picked up the keys and knew that I was out. And told me that he would have to call me back after he figured things out. He never called back. I texted him later to follow up but all I got were short or no responses to my questions. No, they didn't know whose stuff it was. No answer when I told him I was freaked out and wanted to know what had happened. 
Yeah, he had gotten both sets of keys from the Riveter, and no, he hadn't found anything else. Not long after I got my full deposit back, which I hadn't been expecting since I felt bad for not staying my whole lease. I hadn't planned on asking for it. It wasn't until relaying this all to my mom later that I realized exactly how weird this whole thing was, or what my landlord might have been making up at the squatter. She pointed out how strange it was that a guy who was supposedly traveling too much to use his own house would show up himself to walk through the house after I left, especially since his brother did everything while I lived there. Neither of us are really sure if he was up to something, or if there really had been some extremely creepy stalker or squatter situation. Either way, the whole thing seriously messed with my already messed up head.